G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. At age 26 in 2008, as the GFC hit, he decided to pivot from the safe job of school teacher to market four-wheel drive accessories online for someone else. In 18 months, he helped grow that business from $3 million to $5 million in annual sales. Soon after, the owner took a chunk of money out of the business and let it collapse, leaving Dan owed a lot. Vowing he could grow the same online business but manage its finances better, first year sales were $250,000. After four years working on his own, a six week bike ride through Siberia with a mate with barely any internet access was the catalyst for Dan hiring his first team member and growth really took off from there. Now with five and a half full time equivalent team members and sales growing between 30 and 64% per annum over the last 10 years, they now have a multiple seven figure business. Growth has been funded from profits with no debt or investors needed. Dan believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is identifying the most important tasks which make a difference to your growth and actually getting them done. An advice he'd give himself on day one is, understanding that this is the biggest opportunity of your life to make a difference, set your BHAG, aim high. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Dan Kazaris from KPD Industries. Thanks for your time today, Dan. Yeah, no worries, Troy. Happy to, happy to be here. Uh, maybe let's start with how we know each other. It was Mark from Mustard Bikes, wasn't it, that put us in touch? Yeah, so I met Mark uh, about a year ago, uh, just just through some other local contacts, and uh, yeah, we get together on a semi regular basis um, to just discuss business and keep ourselves motivated and make sure as as business owners we're you know focusing on the right things um, to yeah to to grow basically. Yeah, good. Yeah, Mark reached out to me on email a few weeks ago. He just binge listened to all the podcasts. I think I was up to eight or nine at that point. And he said he was getting a lot out of them, which was great. And Tim Palmier, who I'd interviewed on episode five, actually uh, knows Mark and put Mark onto them uh, and then put you and I in touch. And I thought it'd be great to to have a chat, see uh, what you can share with our audience to help them reduce the pain and the stress, I guess, in their growth as well. Yep, yep. No, it sounds um, sounds all good. Yeah, happy to. It's actually been um, interesting just going through the the list of questions. It's uh, you know brought up a, a, a few, um, or highlight a few points about my business that um, you know I I should be probably focusing on more as well. So yeah, it's just just good to be here and um, and have this conversation. So. Yeah, great. Well, tell our audience a bit about your business. You know where it's located, what it does, how it makes money, etc. Yep. So KPD Industries, um, we basically have two uh, main functions in the business where um, the owners and operators of uh, KPD 4x4.com.au uh, and that's a, a 4x4 aftermarket accessories uh, e-commerce retail website and the other component of the business is that we're the owners of um, Carbon Winches and Off-Road Products Australia. So uh, in, in that part of the business, we manufacture and distribute a 4x4 electric winch um, to the market here in Australia. And we're also developing um, uh, an export market uh, currently in uh, the Middle East. And we're developing some uh, business in Europe and looking at options at the USA at the moment. Um, the main hub of the business is based in Victoria. Um, I'm I'm the owner. I, I've been uh, living and, and working um, here in, in Tasmania uh, for the last two years. And basically the main reason I moved down here was to just separate myself from the day-to-day runnings and operational side of the business, which I felt was just holding me back from actually, uh, you know, the old uh, montage of working on the business. Um, so having that physical separation was... Yeah, uh, Michael Gerber from the E-Myth, work on the business, not in the business, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. So um, so it was a bit of that. I've, I've also got a young daughter. Um, she's 14 months old and I figured uh, Taz, Tazzy's uh, uh, the perfect place to bring up a, a kid. Um so yeah, we ma- we manufacture winches. Uh, we have we sell to retail. We have a wholesale network of about a hundred, um, uh, mainly 
um, self-managed independent off-road shops around Victoria. Uh, we do sell to some um, bigger branded chain stores who like our product. Uh, and yeah, that's that's uh, and we have our retail online site, which has been running. You know, that's that's where I started as a as an online retailer, uh, basically. But um, in about 2012, um, just just through basic analysis of the business, um, I realised that as a retailer, uh, you're the middleman. You uh, we were getting squeezed. Uh, well, there was increasing competition coming into the e-com space in our industry. Um, so there was more competition, which meant the pricing was, was coming down. Um, our wholesalers and suppliers were putting their prices up. So we weren't making as much margin as a, as purely as a retailer. So I made the decision to, um, start working on a product, um, that we could manufacture and distribute ourselves and, and control and manage and do it better than what was currently available. And before we move on to how, how you started out, I just want to circle back. You, so you, you and your wife aren't from Tasmania, but you decided to have a bit of a sea change or tree change, moved down here a couple of years ago. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. It's interesting because this is now my 13th episode. I've been trying to get out of Tasmania to interview businesses that aren't in Tasmania. Ben De Jong in, uh, that I thought was in Perth a few episodes ago was actually born in in Tasmania so I can't seem to escape off this little island at the moment which is not a bad thing it's a good place to be but we will get there <laughs> yeah so back in the second episode was with Charles Beaumont Bowie a good friend of mine who runs three furniture stores here in Tasmania the importer and he made the extreme step of getting away from the detail and working in the business like yourself uh, three or four years ago he and his wife moved the kids up to Byron Bay and they he managed the business from there three stores uh, a lot of staff, so he he spent a year or two planning that move. So I think that's a really smart way to go about getting yourself out of that uh, detail because you and I both know what it's like if you're there and if you haven't built the culture up and systems, uh, then people will inevitably just be stealing your time and focus all the time if you're present, if you're there. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, um, you know, that, that was a big driver for... Um, I guess it was a bit of a challenge for myself as well to uh, to see if I could do it, see if I could really manage the business remotely because that was probably a focus from right from the start that I could run the business from wherever because I value having a lifestyle and, and being flexible. And, and so moving to Tassie was a bit of a test of that after, you know, basically um, running the business for about seven years. It was you know, time to sort of uh, get my current staff to step up and, and take more responsibility and and for me to actually take the business more seriously. Yeah. So, yeah. Tell the audience how you started out. Yep. So I, um, look, originally I um, completed a double degree at Montmash Gippsland in Victoria. Um, so I'm a qualified PE and outdoor education teacher. Um, so I worked in that market or that industry for a few years and, and um, pretty like even though I really enjoyed um, helping people and you know developing um, uh, students uh, through outdoor education still very passionate about that um, I very quickly worked out that I would be capped with my salary potential um, and I since I was probably 18, I'd always had this idea that I would run my own business. Um, so uh, after a few years of working in the industry, I moved on. Um, I uh, got a, you know, long story short, I got a, a marketing. I convinced a, a, a full drive online retailer um, back in about 2008 that I could be his marketing and advertising manager. Did you, so, have, any, did you have any marketing experience at that point? No, no, I had no formal marketing <laughs> or advertising experience. <laughs> fake, fake it till you make it, yep. Yeah, oh, exactly. But I, I told him up front that yeah. I, I just said to him, marketing is education. Um, I said to him, I've been training for this position for the last, you know, I, I went to uni for four years on, on how, to, um, how to educate people. I understand how people learn so I can use those skills to help you in your business to get your message out to the market and, and um, increase your exposure and 
And, and that's what we did. It worked really well. Like for 18 months, that business was doing about three mil a year when I came on board. And within 18 months, we'd um, built that to five mil a year. Wow. Uh, and yeah, but unfortunately, um, my, the owner of the business um, couldn't manage the, the, his spending. Uh, he right. Basically basically ran the business into the ground through mismanagement so okay and um, so and that that was 2008 so you're really coming out just after the gfc and you were able to get that kind of growth almost yeah. double in 18 months that's fantastic <laughs> yeah, look i call it the gold i call it the gold rush era of the online four-wheel drive market um there weren't many people doing it back then and we just made some really common sense choices. We built a good, easy website. We were active on marketplaces like eBay. Um, and we just got some crazy growth through some basic, um, some basic marketing strategy. And so, um, yeah. So after all that happened, um, I decided if, you know, my, uh, I guess the, <laughs> the idiot boss that I used to work for can, can, build a multi-million dollar online company, I can probably do the same thing, yeah. um, but not make the same mistakes that he did. So yeah. that led me to, that led me to start KPD in 2010, um, yeah. just from scratch. So, and it's always been a purely online business. Um, initially it was, uh, so I was running the business from home, um, in, it was about, um, I think it was about 2017, um, we actually moved into our first leased premises, commercial premises, um, and then we, that was, that was um, in a period of um, like about a, oh, just over a year into um, the brand launch of Carbon Winch. So we launched that in June 2016. We moved into the, um, the actual commercial premises in about, Oh, it was mid 2017 because um, we were we were just completely overrun. Like it was just impossible to run the business from home at that point. So um, yeah, and, and we found very quickly that we we grew again very rapidly once we had some space to get organised properly, and we outgrew that space and moved into another lease premises um, of probably it was at least nearly it was over double the size that we were in yeah um and, and it's still there now that one and, and yeah we're still there we're still in that space there now so, and did they have retail outlets to them as well um so no we we oh the first one had a very small retail frontage yep. um the second one had quite a large retail frontage uh but because we were based in a regional area down near phillip island in san remo um it wasn't a major focus for us um yep. The main focus was the online sales and also uh, developing our dealer network for our winch product. Got it. So, yeah. Um, we recently, I was just back back in Vic a couple of weeks ago and we recently um, chopped the retail shop front display um, by two thirds to create more workspace um, for, for the team. Um, and that's, that's just a, you know, a general sort of, I guess, indication of where our business is going. It's, it's definitely not, going in the in the direction of a um, bricks and mortar retail it's yeah very heavily going in the other direction yeah so right even though we've, we've dabbled in it um, it's really not it's really not us so we've identified that and, and and for our audience San Remo Victoria Australia not United States so you're based <laughs> southeast of Melbourne basically just out of Melbourne a little bit yeah that's right um, you know probably the we're, we're right um, we're still on the mainland, but right next to Phillip Island, where they've got the um, the Phillip Island Penguin Parade. It's probably one of the biggest tourist attractions in in Victoria. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, if that provides some context to the location. And when you moved to Tassie, you said you also had a retail outlet down here for about a year as well, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. So we, um, I met some some locals in Kingston, uh, some really great people, and. They were. They had just renovated a, a shop, a shop front in um, in a really high volume sort of traffic area, uh, good exposure um, point, and I was sort of looking for potentially somewhere to work, and so it just li li lined up pretty well um, to just get a one year lease and um, work, you know, have somewhere to work outside of home, um, 
and and basically create a bit of awareness about our brand and our product here in Tassie. Um, and look, it worked really well, but um, what we found that when the lease was up for renewal, uh, we did an analysis um, from a financial perspective and also um, from a, a strategic perspective. And again, uh, you know, having a bricks and mortar retail outlet for our style of business um, just wasn't on the radar in terms of an opportunity for us uh, for growth. So, you know, it was in very, it was crazily important for us to go through that analysis process to make that decision. Um, and as I said to you before, Troy, um, just before we went online, uh, you know, the first two weeks of me coming back to working from home, uh, our sales grew 20%. So, yeah. you know, that, that's um, an indication of I've been spending time in the right areas on my on my business. So. so yeah, that's a couple of weeks after you decided to get out of that retail space here in Tasmania. You went back to really focus online and you saw a 20% bump. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 And look, there were some other factors like um, some additional staff coming on board. So increased capacity to get some work done and, yep. and that. But um, it's, yeah, it's been a positive, um, positive move for the business. And so 2010, you started on your own. How old were you at that stage? Uh, I was 28. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's move into some key numbers you can share with the audience to illustrate the growth of the business. Obviously, they're quite interested to hear this is what we're all about, really, at Grow Small Business is growth. Um, so, is there any numbers you can share to give the audience an idea? Yeah. Look, look, I can't share like exact, um, you know, dollar figures, but um, like to provide some context, uh, I guess, to where we started and, and where we're at now. Uh, our first, um, in our first year, I, I just, from a total startup, e-commerce, full drive parts, online store, we, um, I turned over about 250000 um, wow, in great. revenue. Um, that was 10 years ago this year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah so that was back in um, 2010. Yeah. started. Uh, and then for the next sort of four years over that, we saw an average um, growth rate of about 25%. Yeah. Right. And um, so in 2012, I started the R&D project on our, on our winch. Yeah. Um, and and that, took, that took basically four years to launch. So we launched that in June 2016. The, the year prior to our launch, we grew 35%. Yep. And then from the launch date, well, from... Basically, the start of the 2016 financial year to the end of the 2019 financial year, um, we've averaged about 43% growth over those um, exactly. over those years. So that's great. The, yeah, the biggest. Um, I was just having a look at the figures uh, this morning, and so 16, 17. So the first year of our um, of our winch brand launch, um, yeah, it was, you know, 64% over the previous year. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, that was, that, that, that was a, a really, you know, encouraging, um, like I, I just wanted to build a winch to bring on the market to have a good product to sell. I, I really had no plans at that point in time to offer it to trade or had yeah. no idea of the take-up that we'd get. But um, it was, it happened pretty, like it was, pretty evident pretty quickly that we were onto a good thing at the time so yeah and from a guess from a revenue point of view what kind of percentage split is the winch side of the business to all the other products that you sell uh look pretty much in the i'd say in the last 12 months where we're probably looking at at somewhere around 70 percent of yep. um the revenue is coming from our own branded product now mm -hmm. um and the other 30 percent is um through um just general online retail so we we represent a number of um brands here in australia um so we do have another product that we import and distribute from germany um that's exclusive to us but all of the rest of it we, we're just dealers for other products in, yeah. in that retail space so in that 30 percent you're still going to keep i guess that 30 percent not ditch it and just fo purely focus on your own products you want to keep that in the product mix uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, it's it's um, it, it offers just another um, another dimension to the business, which is um, super easy to manage. Um, we use some fairly um, some fairly great um, online management um, software to manage the business. Um, it's 
makes it very easy to process online orders and and you know um, get a get a solid return off off that. And we are focusing quite heavily on uh, on growing that um, that channel as well. We 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 think we can probably you know double or triple our revenue uh, in in that particular in the online retail side of things in the right. next year or so so we've got some pretty big targets and a lot of work um that we're doing to build that side of the business as well as our own branded stuff so yeah great and another context of size i guess you've got five and a half full-time equivalent team members so you've got three in victoria one in brisbane yourself down here as well and a part-time casual so that all rolls up to about five and a half team members yep. again. great that's right yep and when you started in 2010, was it just yourself? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. just myself. Yeah, that's great. Over um, 10 years, go to one to five and a half FTE and that phenomenal growth. I'll work the average out later. It's you know averaging probably 25 30% per year across those 10 years is phenomenal. Well done. Yeah, thanks. It's, um, look, it's, I think, I think it's just you know just extreme vigilance in, in many aspects of the business. So yep. um, like we, we could probably have double the amount of staff at this point in time, um, and we might be double the size in revenue. But uh, it's just been a, a, a nice you know consistent growth rate. Um, yeah, you know I was I guess from my previous employment um, experience, it, you know I got a bit scared about having that really fast growth and, and seeing what it could do. Um, if it wasn't managed properly, so yeah, yeah, um, I've just been yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with where we're at at the moment. Yeah, great. Uh, well, the next two questions I've just introduced, thanks to Ben Crowley, who I interviewed on episode ten. Uh, Ben's from Bulk Nutrients. So, when was the moment you felt you had succeeded? <laughs> I had to have a think about this question. Um, tough one. <laughs> it is. It is a tough, tough question, and. Um, I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm a fairly hard critic on myself, so I don't know if I've actually had that moment just yet, to be honest. Mm. Um, I, I think, uh, I think back in 2017, we had a, a, you know, we engaged a business coach, um, to come on board. Um, and when we had someone from outside the business come in and look at what we'd done, um, up to that point and, and then clearly outline the potential that we had moving forward. I think if, yeah, I think that was, if I had to name a moment, that was probably yep. the moment that I felt that I'd actually had some success, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And Ben's next question as part of that is, what does success look like to you? Um, again, it depends if we're talking about personal or business success. Um, I, I think personally, um, it's, it's basically being able to be financially independent and a, and a master of my own de destiny, uh, being able to spend time with my family, um, having time to engage throughout the day uh, with my one-year-old daughter um, by working from home and being able to support my wife is massively important for me at this point in time. And I feel that I'm successful in, in that um, aspect of, of, yeah. hmm. of my life. And I think from a business perspective, it's, it's um, to me. It's about market recognition. Uh, it's it's about increasing our market share in our industry, and I really enjoy playing an active role in the the growth and success of our dealer network. And um, and uh, and aside from that, um, provi providing just stable, secure, long term employment for my team. Yeah. Um, you know that's that's. Um, also a massively important thing and um you know something in this current climate that we're in um we're focusing very heavily on strategy to make sure that we're uh going to be in a good position moving forward um you know no matter what's thrown at us basically and for context of the timing what we're talking about there is the current uh, coronavirus issue tasmania is pretty much just going into lockdown now so it's very interesting times for us kind of helpful that i work from home and a lot of your or half your team does as well so it's good a lot of businesses pivoting that way it, just to go back on a point you made that 
success for you is finding that balance to invest that time with your daughter and your wife. And that's, I'm finding that more and more common these days, people going into business and changing their lifestyles. So they do have that. That's certainly the main reason I went into business for myself 20 years ago now was to be able to grow, uh, grow up with my kids was, was one of my driving reasons. So I think it's becoming even more important these days in society with people stressed out you know melbourne and sydney three hour commutes it's you know i think it's really yeah. challenging mm. that's it and and i i um offer the you know the the same sort of flexibility options to my uh, employees as well um you know a, a couple of them have got their own well yeah a few of them have got their own families and and so you know being um you know pretty flexible when it comes to leadership um so if we I figure what goes around comes around. If if um, we you know offer that flexibility, we get we get good um, returns back um, from the employees. So yeah, yeah, it works works out pretty well. Absolutely. Let's let's talk funding. How have you funded the business's growth? Uh, well, well, basically when I started, um, I was owed quite a lot of money from my previous employer. So I basically started in a negative position. So I um, he didn't pay that to you. No, I, I look. I got some back through the government. Um, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, there was a you know, I got my super back and and, and that sort of thing. So uh, the which business I, actually imploded, it went under. Yeah, pretty much. There was just a whole a huge wad of cash that was taken out of the business, and no yeah. one, no one was paid. Basically, no, that's terrible. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, um, but look, it, it 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 gave me some extreme motivation to make sure that I I ran the business properly. Yes, good uh, lesson. Mm. Yeah, so. Uh, basically, we I, I had existing relationships with a lot of suppliers, so um, obviously there was a bit of a stigma attached with um, being attached to that, uh, be, or being you know associated with that previous business. So um, there was a lot of um, you know there was a lot of trust building and relationship management that I had to do to uh, basically convince some of these suppliers that they should be dealing with me. Yep. Um, and look, the way I did that was just basically paid everyone up front. So I didn't run any credit. Yeah. Um, we got the money into the business. We used that to pay the suppliers up front. Um, and, and that's how I managed to just sort of grow from, from where we are, where we are. And after, you know, uh, after about six years, we we're able to have enough capital there to, you know, launch our, our winch brand. And so, so funding has been from yourself and the business profits. You haven't taken bank debt or investors on. Uh, no, it's 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 basically we haven't really needed to look for external funding. As I've been quite happy with um, the the growth rate that we were um, experiencing. So, um, look, there, there might have been some uh, you know some opportunities there for us to look at some external investment um, to bring in um, uh, some bring in some external experience uh, and some more, um, I guess, business now and, and um, you know, knowledge into the business to help us grow. But it just ended up being that we've just funded it ourselves and haven't, haven't um, required any external funding at this point in time. So, um, yeah. Great. That's, that's, yeah. that's fantastic. That is really good. Another question here from Ben, new question. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry today? If not, why and what else would you do? Um, look, I think, um, I think the key to any startup in this current climate is being able to have a point of difference and, and offering some real value to the market. Uh, I've seen some pretty well-funded ventures uh, come and go in the last few years in our industry and it hasn't really worked for them because they just didn't get the formula right. Uh, I've also seen some less well-funded businesses just completely, ex you know, explode with okay. growth. Yeah. So, um, because they they understand what the market demands. So, I would, I'd definitely consider entering the industry as a startup today uh, yeah. with good, good funding um, and a strong message to the market and a and a serious point of difference. Uh, yeah, that's good. If, you're just going to churn out something similar to what's there at the moment. Um, it's probably not going to work. Yeah, it's one of the key messages in marketing, isn't it? Just differentiate, make sure you've got a different offering uh, to, to your customers, to the market, yeah. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so far so our audience can learn from it? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's very clearly bookkeeping and accounting. 
Oh, uh, really? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. This for, for me, it's uh, yeah, it's um, basically it's been the biggest headache uh, over my journey uh, as a as an online retailer. Initially, we we had probably up to forty different suppliers yeah. that we were dealing with. So the paperwork aspect of of being a, a, an online retailer uh, was just incredible. Yeah, it was crazy. And so um, basically finding and relying on people to uh, manage my books um, to the standards that we need and also doing the basics like lodging bads and tax returns and, and that sort of thing. I hate uh, paperwork. It's just not my strength. Yeah. So uh, within the first few years, I, I, I really didn't have any systems. Um, I within probably three or four years, it got to a point where I was just I really needed to outsource it. So um, we which we, we found some bookkeepers. We tried, you know, um, it was hard to hard to find people that would that would actually understand our business because we we're also importing product as well. Yeah. So there's there's different tax implications when you import product. Sure is. Uh, mm. Yeah. So finding just finding the right people uh, to help us through um, our compliance with the ATO was was pro- has probably been our biggest headache. We've had a number of starts, a number of failures. Uh, I've now, one of my full timers now manages the accounts in house, right? And, yep. um, and we're finding that that's that's been the biggest um, benefit for our business because that person knows all of our suppliers. It knows how we do business. Um, and the invoices that she's looking at have some context to her. So, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, that's been the biggest one for me. Yeah, okay. Um, and what areas in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to have the greatest value? You're probably going to answer this bookkeeping problem. <laughs> um, look, look, I think uh, the, I guess, I think customer service and product development, um, yeah. actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, getting the product right and making sure that our customers were extremely well serviced, better than any anyone else in the industry, uh, I think was um, key to building confidence in our brand uh, initially as a, as, a, as a new brand, a new startup, uh, uh, and, and also marketing. Uh, you know, being able to effectively educate the market with a clear message. Um, it, it took a lot of work initially and it, it's just it's it's just unbelievable the amount of work it takes at the moment to um, effectively market your product to, a, you know, very busy, um, you know, very busy online environment. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we're working hard on that and I think, when we work hard on that, we, we get the value back. So. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is Peter Drucker when he says that there are only two things in business that add true value and that's marketing and innovation. Everything else is a cost. I think that's so true. And illustrated, oh, sure. illustrated by you dropping the f- physical retail, jumping back into the online space and really focusing on the, the marketing side of things has seen the, the growth continue upward. Yeah, exactly. And and we've, we've got a, a big... Uh, a, a big focus on on developing our, our marketing um, plan even further and, and pushing harder into the market, understanding um, platforms like, uh, you know, the Google marketing suite and Facebook uh, marketing. And we've had some great training on that in the past, but um, it constantly changes and updates. And so, yeah, you've got to stay on top of it. So stop on top of it. So we're spending a lot of time in that space. That's good. And back to your point on customer service, I agree with you and Ben Crowley from Bulk Nutrients, episode 10. It is a real point of difference to uh, provide great customer service. And I don't think it's that hard to do or that expensive. And a lot of businesses just don't see don't see the value. So I agree with you both on that. That's a really good perspective to have. Yeah, yeah, we we've we've just recently uh, brought on some some for, some new uh, you know software into the business to help us uh, manage the the increase in in volume. Um, so yeah, we're using Zendesk now to manage our um, yep. our incoming um, customer you know, inquiry channels. So yep. we're still learning about that um, particular product suite, but we're finding that it's it's good. We're not really missing it missing anything at the moment so yeah great yeah 
And what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if my guys will listen to this podcast or not. <laughs> people, <laughs> managing people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a common, um, common thread. Mm. Yeah. Look, that's been a challenge. Um, and, and when there's when there are problems, um, it's it's not an, an enjoyable thing. Um, having to do the right thing for the business uh, takes a huge amount of resolve and commitment uh, to keep people on track uh, when it comes to productivity and, and focusing on um, the right the right tasks that we need to do. Um, my leadership style is fairly relaxed, uh, and I do put a lot of responsibility back on my team yep. um, for their own performance. Um, so. But we do have a regular process of um, reviewing that performance. Out of interest, how often do you do that? Uh, Annual, okay. quarterly? For, formally, it's formally it's it's every six months. Yeah. Um, but it's it's informally it's weekly. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're often identifying say gaps in um, performance and 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 trying to you know, make sure the team's on, on top of it. So yeah, I'm a big uh, advocate of the manager tools, Mark and Mike, the, the, the number one business podcast on the internet, uh, weekly one-on-ones. Um, in my teams, I have quarterly, uh, job descriptions tailored to the quarters focus for the business. Each JD has tailored goals that someone needs to focus on and hit some KPIs that quarter. They've got keeping an eye on those as well as obviously listing their ongoing responsibilities. But, Quarterly, we sit down at the end of that quarter and, and talk about how the performance went rather than just doing an annual review, which I used to do when I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers. All the managers hated doing it. They'd rush it. They'd forget about what you did 10 or 11 or even seven months ago. Uh, and it was just such a waste of time, I thought. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think my team actually um, really, really enjoys the opportunity to have that one-on-one with me because they often have, like it, you know, it's it's an open open conversation. We uh, I usually ask them a number of different questions and get their feedback, and and then you know open the floor for them to let me have it. Basically, <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's great. Uh, yeah, and it, it's um, yeah, it's it's definitely uh, an important thing to keep people uh, on track. Yeah, so. that's good. And what's been the biggest mindset shift in your small business growth journey? Uh, probably understanding the actual potential uh the first sort of seven years i would say that i was just cruising along and and enjoying what i was doing and but not really focusing on the future so i think it was about 2017 when i brought on a business coach Uh, so there's someone from outside the business who was able to critically i guess analyze uh where we had come from and what our opportunities were moving forward, having someone uh, in a in a position of authority uh, from a, a high level corporate um, background in my industry, uh, tell me that basically, you know, if if you really focus on uh, on growth, uh, you know, growth development in your business, this can go a long way. Yep, and I think that was probably the that was probably the, the the biggest mindset shift from 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 right. I'm in a position where I'm just cruising along, enjoying what I'm doing, working for myself. To hang on a sec, we've actually got some yeah. really great opportunity here, and let's let's grab it by the balls and, and yeah. make it happen. Basically, so, that's great. That's a really good uh, juncture in, in your in your business timeline. There, yeah, yeah. And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Look, the number one habit I, I feel is is making sure that the tasks that you are engaged in uh, as an SME owner on a daily basis is actually making a net positive growth difference uh, yep. to your business. So, uh, and and the ability to clarify those tasks is is critical. So you've got to have a plan. Yeah. Uh, we we use a, a a pretty awesome little business planning tool called the VTO or the Vision Traction Organizer. Is that uh, DTO? That's not V2 Mom that Mark Benioff at Salesforce created. Do you know? Uh, no, I'm not 100 percent sure. It's um, it's it's uh, look. We'll, I guess you know you'll put the links up uh, yeah, on the website. Yeah, show notes. Yeah, but um, 
I, I got it. I got exposed to that um, in 2015. I, I bought into a, a franchise in um, freight consulting. Yeah. Um, so through that uh, channel, I was exposed to a whole bunch of um, sales and business development training, and and the VTO was uh, a tool that they use for their planning in, in that space. Right. Um, it, we, I brought it across into my off-road business. Uh, it's, it's basically, it's two pages. So, yeah. you know, some business planning um, templates, you get it 20, 40 pages long. Yeah. And Impractical. Know, yeah. as, a, as a small business owner, that's just a waste of time. But yes. this is, you know, it's clear, it's concise, it's short. It enables you, it, it enables you to cover off your core values, your core yeah. focus, your five-year financial target, your overall marketing strategy, and then it breaks that down into a three-year bigger picture, yep. what the business is going to look like in three years, and then you know further breaks that down into a one-year plan. So, yeah, right, yeah, and then within that, um, you identify um, your financial goals for the year, um, the the tasks that you must do to make yep. that goal happen, mm -hmm. and then also the issues like what are the roadblocks. So yeah, right, that sounds really yeah you know, useful. I think the listeners would would uh, appreciate to learn about that. So I'll, I'll get you I'll get the details from you and add it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, we, we found it um, to be really valuable, and and we we do it on a six monthly basis. Yep. Uh, so yeah, it's it's definitely a good tool for a for a small business. Okay, great. Can you Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our Kick-Ass Manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. Can you talk to how you added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Yeah, look, the first... Um uh, the first employee I brought into the business uh, was in 2014. So after four years of, of running the business myself, um, I decided I needed a holiday. And um, so uh, one of my mates uh, actually invited me to, to do a, a mountain bike um, trip for six weeks uh, on the road of bones in Siberia. So uh, I figured that uh, I wouldn't really have much internet access while I was over in Siberia. Yep. Um, so I, I was kind of forced uh, to basically bring someone into the business um, to run it while I was away. And I also identified at the same time that I was trying to, I was two years into my R&D project with the winch and I was mm. just finding it hard to manage the volume of operations that I needed to do to run the online business and, you know, keep making progress. So, um so I brought on, uh, yeah, basically I just put it out to my social network and um, I was able to find someone local uh, who was a full drive enthusiast uh, to, to come into the business. So, yeah, he already knew the product groups that we dealt with. Um, and another sort of side benefit was that um, he was actually uh, part of the work cover rehabilitation scheme. And so he was able to, we were able to bring him into the business um, under the work cover rehabilitation scheme. Uh, and we were able to get a 30% rebate on his income. Uh, I think it was yep. for the first 12 months. Right. Yeah, win, win, win. Yep, that, that worked out pretty well. Um, for us, it eased the pain of bringing someone in, and it, and it, it just it was amazing what it did, just, just bringing yep. in a, uh, an employee to basically double our work capacity. Yep. Uh, and then from then on, yeah, look, basically um, I've sort of developed a more formal process for bringing people on onto the business. Um, I still, I, I've made a few mistakes. Uh, we've, we've, I've, I've rushed a few people into the business. Uh, yes, done that before. Mm. In, in hindsight, uh, I, in hindsight, in both cases, uh, I had a gut feeling that maybe it probably wasn't the right thing to do, but I just needed someone to help. Yeah, uh, and it pretty much yeah in both cases after um, a period of time those people were you know I had to sort of move those people on because they for whatever reason you know one was yeah. a just a culture fit wasn't a yep. good culture fit the other one was just basically a, a, a lack of capacity to get the job done um, yeah. the, he was a junior and I put him into a fairly intensive sales role and it and it just uh, he was just too young for yeah you know, for, to maintain the responsibility it was too hard for him. So anyway, um, but yeah, we've, I think, 
I think if people are looking to hire people, one question that I I haven't I keep forgetting to ask is. Uh, and and, and I'm, I, I'm, I need to clarify with my HR um, advisors about how I can ask this question, but it's important to understand um, the person, a person's health and their capacity to do the job that you're looking to hire them for. And so it's a question that I haven't asked in the past and it's, it's something that is, you know, can be an issue if, if people have ongoing health issues that you're not aware of it can affect their ability to do the job even yeah. though they feel they might be capable of doing it. So Absolutely. We've literally just experienced that in one of the companies that I work on at the moment. Two of our staff members there um, have some pretty serious medical conditions that have just come to light. So, yeah, we're going through that at the moment as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, it's not, it's, I guess I can't say it's unfortunate, but um, I've, I've, you know, got a few guys on the team that have some health issues that I wasn't aware of at the time when I employed them. So, um, and that definitely has an impact on how they do their job. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's something that during the interview process, you need to work out how you can ask it legally mm. and, and, and get, you know, get that information um, to help you make a decision yep. that that person is the right or wrong person for the job. Yep. Let's talk a bit about culture. You're an interesting business similar to James McGregor at Biteable uh, and a few other that I've in, uh, interviewed where they've got a disparate workforce. So you're in three locations, Brisbane, Victoria and Tasmania. You, you're five and a half FTEs splayed across those locations. So what, yep. what are some things you recommend to building and a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Uh, look, I guess... Probably the number one thing is just maintaining um, a regular, you know, open line of communication. So we try and have a, a group video chat meeting once a week. Great. Yep. Um, and and during that uh, during that chat, I try and be completely honest with the guys in terms of where we're at with the business. Um, we try and encourage ownership um, of their roles, and uh, when when we do that, if the business has a win, it's, it's, it's truly an achievement for them personally as well. Um, I, fo- I find that involving the staff in uh, business planning uh, and the opportunities that we have for growth is a great way to engage them in the business and they often add some really amazing value as well. They've got some great ideas. They're on the coal face on a daily basis uh, talking with our client base and uh, getting that feedback and getting that information uh, from the market that help us make decisions about how we can you know, continue doing what we do, basically. Yeah, so, yeah, great. <clears throat> how much professional development have did you invest in yourself? Uh, initially, not much. Uh, I, I figured that just just by going to uni, uh, you I one of the things that I realised is that uh, uni teaches you a, a process of learning. And so just by running the business, I was able to learn a lot from just just running it, I guess, um, working with some common sense, just really focusing on common sense values and ethics. Uh, so, you know, simple stuff like sell stuff for more than what I paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. What about more recently, books, courses, conferences yeah look it's um I, in that freight consulting franchise i bought into we did a lot of sales and business development um training they had some really strong uh training in in that um in that business so i was i went to a lot of conference a yearly or well, twice yearly conferences yep. where we focus on all aspects of business development from marketing social media engagement um you know uh sort of just growth opportunities how to how to sell uh, and other things like I, I go and we, we've had some connection with um, say Facebook directly where we had an account manager um, allocated to us for six six months and we, we'd uh, meet on a, a weekly basis and they would run through the process of uh, building online social media campaigns yep. and ads and things like that so that was really good to do to do that um, we had the same thing happen with google adwords as well uh, where we had a, a consultant um, that was 
paid by Google to basically teach us how to right. run our AdWords campaigns and remarketing and all that. So I try and get to one industry-related conference a year. We're, we're a member of the um, Australian Automotive Aftermarket Association. So uh, we try and keep engaged with, with the market through, through that channel. And I try and do at least one business development related type conference. And so one of the recent ones I went to was uh, like that Kerwin Ray um, oh, yep. meeting in Hobart. So, you know, that was pretty much a good lesson in, um, in the extremely hard sell. Um, right, so, right. Yeah. yeah I, I, I didn't progress any further with down that, down that channel, but it was just interesting to go through and, and see yeah, they do. Yeah, I've so. seen a lot of those ads on Facebook. Um, let's talk. Uh, you've mentioned your coach back in 2017. Have you had any other coaches or any mentors or peer mentoring you've done? Yeah, so so we do. I've I've got a one of my um, personal uh, personal friends is uh, an ex uh, executive who's worked in uh, you know businesses like Telstra and the. He's retired now, but he currently sits on the board of a, a number of different uh, organisations. And I guess we, we meet up on a semi-regular basis in an informal manner just to discuss, yeah. you know, the, the my business and he provides some, some great value to me. So uh, that's, yeah, pretty much something that we I do at the moment. Um, I also meet up with Mark from uh, Mustard Bikes, who's yep. another local online um, retailer. Yeah. So, well, he manufactures and retails as well. So yep. we sort of bounce ideas and, and keep each other motivated um, yeah, on a regular great. basis. Yeah, I think it's really important, even just peer mentoring over a coffee or a lunch or a beer. I think it's good to keep that, get that uh, learning going and, and keeping your mind open to new ideas from other people. Yeah, for sure. It's um, you know, I listen to a few podcasts um, here and there as well, uh, but generally, it's um, yeah, it's just just good to have like having that face to face contact and and catching up uh, with with local other local business owners is a it's a really good thing. Great. Well, we're into the final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Um, oh, I've just got to try and find my answer here. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, identifying the most important tasks which will make a difference to your growth and actually getting them done. To focus. Um, it's so easy to feel busy and have that busyness, but it, you may not be effective working on yeah. the right things. Yeah. yeah. Staying on task um, myself as a business owner and keeping my team on task. That's, that's a constant. It's not a battle, but it's a, it's a constant thing that you must maintain vigilance on. Yeah. Yeah, I love that saying. If every, if, if everything is a priority, nothing is. <laughs> That's it. Favorite business book which has helped you the most? Oh, look, there's probably two. Um, one of the one of the uh, a really good, quick, easy read was um, "Becoming a Key Person of Influence" by Daniel Priestley. Right. Um, uh, that's a it's it's a good, easy read about developing a successful mindset and um, positioning yourself as an authority in your industry as yep. well. Great. Um, yeah, I, I find it a, a pretty good, um, I find that a pretty good read. Uh, and, and also another book called Traction uh, by Gino Wickman. And it goes into more depth around the VTO planning tool and, uh, and you know, just discusses about developing a, a simple system for, for running the business. So right. yep. that's another book that's um, Great. Know, had an impact on me. And any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Uh, look, it's I, I try and listen to a range of podcasts in, in both business and, and sort of personal development over the time. Uh, look, a current one that I'm listening to is Mark, um, the Mark Murris one, the mentor. Uh, just listening to stories about other people running their business and, and obviously uh, your podcast, Troy, I uh, listened you know, to all of the podcasts um, that, that you've uh, run as well and I've definitely got some value out of out of that. So Great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Uh, already mentioned, um, the VTO business planning yeah. tool, so the Vision Traction Organizer. Okay, great. And my the last question and my favourite, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting a small business? <laughs> Understanding that this is the biggest opportunity of your life to make a difference in your future. Yeah. So, uh, set 
set your BHAG, you know, which is yep. a big, very audacious goal. Yep, Jim Collins I, built to last. I think he coined that that phrase. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you aim high, um, you know, you, you can you can just basically do everything you can to make it happen. So yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Dan, for your time today. I think the audience will get a shitload of value out of uh, what you shared with us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries, Troy. Um, you know, happy to spend time with you, mate. It's been, it's been great. Cheers. Great. We'll catch up for a beer down at uh, the Hobart Brewing Company. Yeah, look forward to it. Great. Thanks. And for our audience, we'd greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 